uh, also a little bit of action, limitations, etc., etc. I hope that um, as this is our your last lecture of the entire uh, school, I hope that I will be able to sum up all of your knowledge in such a one hour lecture and after a while we could have time to share our topics and events and discussions. So, um, good evening, good evening. It's not good for me to read all the meeting chat, otherwise I will reply immediately on real time to each of one. So, um, hi. Again, so I am sharing my presentation immediately. I have two windows here. Uh, so, in order to start, okay, uh, I hope you all see it. Is it okay? Uh huh. I have to check what I think. Okay. Yes, we can see the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, exactly as I did in my uh, very uh, low presentation. Uh, together we will go through the conflict resolution, the principles of successful collaboration and justified limitations of collaboration in environmental justice and environmental conflicts. Once more, I am Ermelinda Mahmoutai. I uh, give lectures of environmental rights in the Faculty of Natural Sciences in the University of Tirana. I have been for a long time an environmental uh, activist and my background is mostly on uh, nature conservation principles. So, um, let's get a brief overview which are the topics that we will go through together. So, initially we will have an introduction on what are the types of environmental conflicts how are they mapped so far in the literature and how are their typologies? What are the driving interests? Are, there so, are they so explicit or are they grouped or are they complex? We will say it together. What are the roots of environmental conflicts? Uh, is there an answer to that? Is it a combined uh, situation? What can we do about it? Are we causing it or not? What are the approaches and methods for environmental conflict resolution? Are they too difficult? If they exist, why are not I are they not being used so far? Uh, and do we compromise during an environmental conflict resolution? If we do, do we have limitation? It depends on what. So, as you will see, the topic is a bit tough, I would say, not because it is difficult to understand. Uh, I am pretty sure you have gained so far enough knowledge to get all the terminology, but it is tough because it is a very complex issue when we talk about environmental conflicts, especially if we consider that they are completely integrated with human conflicts. So, in those terms, I think that this is a bit of tough lecture, but at the same time, uh, I would like to think that this would intrigue you more. So let's start uh, with a little bit of uh, common understanding of the vocabulary that we will use today. So uh, when we talk about environmental conflicts, we need to be clear that it is all about environmental resources. So all the conflicts are about resources and environmental resources are the living and non-living things on Earth that provide the benefits to humanity. And they include uh, resources like minerals and energy and also biological resources, water resources and land. And they can be renewable or non-renewable resources. And by all this, we all understand the humans need all this complexity of resources uh, given by Earth. So, 
In the past, but still today, environmental resources have always been an indicator of the wealth of those being in a position to utilize these resources. So for centuries, access to non-renewable resources like the minerals especially, was directly linked to development. So country, even to states, not only to families and rich people, but also to states that have access to use, to extract and to use non-renewable resources, they are directly linked to development. So it is not directly connected with the places and communities that own in practice these resources. Also, uh, conflicts, when so we, when we talk about environmental resources now when when the conflicts pop up the conflicts pop up while the powers or the powerful people are defending or trying to gain access to those resources so it's all about resources and why because through these resources we can go directly and can ensure directly those that are called ecosystem services. So which are considered conditions and processes through which natural ecosystems and the species that make them up sustain and fulfill humans. So ecosystem services are benefits that we people obtain for free from healthy ecosystems. And they can be provisioning, regulating culture or supporting. So they provide food, water, fiber, genetic resources. They regulate the climate, the disease, the water purification, the pollination. And enable us to develop spiritual and religion uh, service, aesthetic, educational sense of place, etc. And at the same time, uh, they uh, support everything for the production uh, of whatever exists on earth so soil formation nutrient cycling primary production etc etc so uh, this is why it is important so when we talk about environmental conflicts we think about all environmental resources that are necessary for the provision of ecosystem services and we talk about people trying to gain access to these resources so that for centuries they are considered to be developed and wealthy and then why how it is how are these all connected and why are policies developed so what we would like when we talk about environment resources when we talk about environment uh, and ecosystem services it's all about preserving environmental resources and not over exploiting them so what do we preserve what do we conserve what do we do do we protect? They are the species, the ecosystems, the habitats, the eco corridors, the landscapes, etc. Because it's them who provide us with ecosystem services for our human well being. At the same time, why do we need to preserve? Because there are threats that exist. And the threats put in pressure, put pressure to the ecosystem services through the conservation targets and to the human well-being. So in order to minimize the threats, we build our conservation strategies. But it doesn't go only like that, because it's the human well-being mainly causing the threats. So it is a closed cycle that needs a solution and a way out. Within this closed cycle, a lot of environmental conflicts raised and one of the most global well-recognized approaches to tackle exactly the conflict these threats and preservation are the sustainable development goals so we are not talking about all this in these lectures this is just an intro uh, that was that i thought it was necessary also for me to prepare the exact background so for the next slides to come. So, so far, what we know about environmental resources is that our Mother Earth and the environment have been very generous with humans by providing a lot of sources uh, so that we could have a healthy and wealthy life. And 
uh, also to have a stable life support system, which has allowed us to develop and flourish as humanity that we are today. At the same time, while we uh, always benefit from the so resources of Mother Earth, at the same time, it is a recognition and acceptance that the resources are finite, so they are not unlimited. But they, at the same time, uh, those resources do not operate separately from each other, but they work in a context and they make an interrelated system which is very complex. So it's an ecosystem of, of living beings in a planet which make the existence of today life uh, availabilities and systems and sustainabilities. And so when we talk about uh, when we talk about environmental conflicts, and we talk about conflicts of mainly over natural resources that have always been part of human. And there is a saying that even though not declared initially, all the wars have been had uh, that we, humanity had, they were about uh, environmental and natural resources. So the conflicts are as old as the first uh, human wars started. So let's think about it. What is an environmental conflict? If we think broadly as a concept, it's a social conflict which is related to environment. And today what we understand with environment is that it's, it includes all the natural resources, the climate conditions, also the human cultural heritage inside it. And what is a conflict? A conflict is a social situation which requires a minimum of two people that would like or have the same interests at the same moments in the, in the same time, but uh, those interests are based on availabilities that have scarce resources. So the resources are not enough for the two parties. So here is the conflict race. And we understand that to have a conflict, we, we need actors, so we need humans, people, we need actions, so they need to act in order to raise a resource, uh, a conflict. But what is important is that when we have conflict, we have incompatibility. That means that those actors go, interests of them go against each other. And in those terms, environmental conflicts have emerged so far as key issues challenging local, regional, national and global security. At the same time, social, political and economic factors and also all interests are all important uh, elements of the process that may eventually lead to conflict. So conflict is raised by all these three main pillars of human development. At the same time, oil, mining and agriculture industries have been focal points of environmental conflicts because it's there where human interaction and natural resources match each other mainly. And recently, to put sugar to the top of it, we have now also climate change, which is deemed to intensify the environmental uh, conflicts, but at the same time, it induces new forms of them in an unknown perspective. So, when we talk, when we talk about conflict typology, and when we talk about relation between human and environment, we immediately think that it is this relation that defines what type of environmental conflicts do we have. And even though the situation is very complex, uh, what is important to understand is that the typology of conflict is very grouped in, in two very logical uh, situations. So we have resource conflicts. When do we have them? We have these resource conflicts when uh, a community or the parties struggle to gain access to natural resources or struggle 
from the use of natural resources. So it's all about social conflict to reach the natural resources and their benefits. At the same time, we have also resource scarcity conflicts. What does it mean? It means that uh, conflicts results from environmental processes, especially when we do not have resources. That means that social relations are put in very, very limited uh, and extreme situations so that a conflict with the race. So lack of water resources, so people will, will fight for the only source of water that is there. So these are a scarcity uh, conflicts. In these two big groups that we uh, we see here and that have been uh, recently uh, organized, there are a different and a complex variety of them. And one that I think is a, is an interesting variety of resource scarcity conflict is what it is called a resource curse. Uh, according to this, if we go through an overexploitation of resources, especially if we do not have a diverse economic context, then it will mean that people or humans will be very dependent on that sole resource and that sole economic context and development. And that would mean that uh, humans would be very vulnerable and a clear target to increase of conflicts and by overpassing the institution uh, and the society will go to economic shocks and also uh, a lot of tension in distribution of resources etc. This is the exact case maybe you have heard about when we talk about resource curse with, we talk about unfair distribution of, envir of uh, environmental resources or benefits and costs at the same time. So in order to uh, give a proper example of them, I can uh, uh, recall uh, two situations in which we are living. So I can call that we are living in a plastic pollution environmental conflict and at the same time we are living in um, energy conflict. Why a plastic pollution conflict? For example, I am taking as an example Albania. Uh, for many years already, uh, people and citizens are addicted to plastic use for all its uh, benefits in practice that provides, so it is cheaper, it is easy to carry around, it is practical, etc., etc. And uh, we didn't consider that by overproducing and overusing plastic, we didn't consider so far that it would bring up such a huge environmental conflict by putting to risks entire water ecosystems and land ecosystems. So, but what do, do we mean that we are dependent? We were dependent until alternative uh, economic developments pop up. These economic developments provided alternative solutions to use of plastics. For example, the textile bags. So a lot of industries started to provide textile bags instead of plastic bags that people can reuse at the same time. Uh, the pipes, you know, the pipes, now alternatives to the plastic pipes are being produced by different uh, countries and companies. So it's all about balance, economic context, development, and for humanity not to be dependent on one source. Another, uh, another example that I can provide uh, to show that we are really in an energy conflict is the situation now with the gas which is the main source of electricity for very and different um, Western uh, European uh, countries. So they are dependent on natural gas, especially for heating and cooking. And they like they lack diversity. So they like diversity of resources, use of resources and technologies and economies being developed to use these resources, which make them dependent and which will increase the vulnerability of these countries until they find additional solutions 
to enter into an environmental uh, conflict. On the other side, even Albania, which depends 90% on renewable sources like water, uh, uh, electricity, it is also a one-way econ uh, development economy in terms of energy production. So, with uh, water drought or with a water crisis, we will be also in a very huge energy conflict. So, these are very actual uh, example of the area that we era that we are living and sharing uh, experiences and concerns with each other. So. Uh, for Albania, environmentalists have always raised the issue of diversification of energy sources and for the gas situation also, but it was it was the, the war in Ukraine that made it so visible. So, what I wanted to stress in all the matter when we talk about environmental conflicts is that motivations are always moral and material. So they interact with each other and they build resource conflicts. And if we would like really to better understand the resource related conflict and if we better understand that we mean that we will go through the right solution, it is only if we, if we really go into critical and full engagement with both the materiality that uh, is needed for our social life, but also the moral that claims natural resources need to be used wisely. So this is crucial when we talk about conflicts, when we talk about conflicts resolution and, uh, and when we talk about uh, sustainability of the planet ecosystems and ourselves. So, Recently, as you may see, there is a new uh, term that is being introduced when we talk about environmental conflicts, which is called ecological distribution conflicts. It's, I call it new because it's from 1995, because the environmental movement is new compared to the other movements. And what it consists of, uh, these ecological distribution conflicts are meant to point out the unfair access to natural resources, to unequally distributed burdens of environmental pollution, like for example, if you have a factory that operates and pollutes a river, then it will be the entire community alongside the river that will suffer the consequences of the pollution. And so this is not equally distributed. And then what is the most important when we talk about conflict, because so far I have never mentioned it, I have mentioned only the need of humanity to live by earth resources and not considering alternatives, but at the same time, a crucial point in conflicts is the exercise of power by different social actors when they enter into disputes over access or impacts on natural resources. So it's all about wealth and power. So now I would like to introduce you to the Environmental Justice Atlas. And according to, he, to this atlas, which is a collection of cases of communities that are struggling for environmental justice around the world, it's an uh, interactive web page. You can go in this. We will go through it a little bit later, but also you can go and, and explore it by yourselves. In this link that I have shared, what is important is that globally you can see how many environmental conflicts are distributed and are being held so far. It's all over the world where community have a voice in saying, where community are being overexploited, and you will see South America and uh, our region and Europe is full of dots of cases that have been erased. So according to this environmental justice atlas and the cases of communities that are shared there, we have 10 environmental conflicts worldwide which are categorized as following. Biodiversity conservation conflicts, it's 
all about protection of biodiversity, values, wild ecosystem and natural flow of living. It's about biomass and land conflicts, always about forest agriculture, fisheries, livestock management. It's all about um, living by net directly living and building economies uh, based on nature resources. Fossil fuel and climate justice and energy is on the top of it and on the top of huge environmental conflict recently. Industrial and utilities conflicts, infrastructure, mineral and building material extractions, especially in development country. This last one is very, uh, um, it's gaining more and more uh, points to go to the top of the chart. Nuclear conflicts also, especially uh, in the recent year, years, the discussion over nuclear energy has been raised a lot. And there is uh, an old and I can say an ancient uh, conflict which has been in standby over this topic and is raising again now. Tourism recreation, very, uh, very much uh, mm, up to date with our uh, way of living, especially our region, waste management and water management. So these are the categories of environmental conflicts, top 10 categories that are identified based on analysis of the cases that have been uploaded in the Atlas. And now, uh, I said that it is a very complex uh, topic, so I have tried in this lecture to give the entire flow and panorama of the environmental conflict, not to understand it as only a conflict of a local community trying to protect a river or a country trying to protect a forest is much more than that because it's popping up everywhere. It is about existence. It is about sustainability and it is about communication, democracy and values. And because of all these, the environmental conflicts have been put as a subsector within environmental security. So the latest developments and the latest analysis and concerns globally have defined this scheme that you see here to make a direct and a comprehensive analysis of the causes and consequences of environmental conflicts. So when environmental conflicts were raised first initially, they were caused only as environment or they were targeted as environmental activism, protecting the plants, protecting the animals, but now they are directly connected to environmental security, existing security. So because of that, into environmental security, there was a huge work done to redefine the security. And for environmental security now, they don't consider only military institutions to talk about security, but also environment consequences and aspects. And so they consider a lot how to handle and manage environmental conflicts for environmental security and uh, existing security. And nowadays environmental conflicts are so, as we say, uh, because they are based on resources, we talked uh, then with, when we refer to them, we, re we refer to non-renewable resources overexploited by years and renewable resources. Nowadays they are the target of many environmental conflicts. And the conflicts of, and the, the big uh, consequence and the key challenge of the environmental conflict is that, as I said, it is not localized in a community. It can be local, it can be regional, national, transnational, and it can be also global. But most importantly, it can be a direct conflict and an indirect conflict. When is it a direct conflict? When do we talk about an environmental conflict that goes directly? It's a conflict that pops up because there is a direct competition between two or more parties for access to the same resources. So if they are the big companies that would like to use um, 
the minerals or water sources of a region, etc., if they would like to use it and there is a direct competition between, between these two more parties, then we have a direct conflict. But uh, what is more uh, attempting and at the same time what can be more challenging and frightening, I would say personally, is the indirect conflict. Direct conflict is easy to tackle, is easy to identify, but indirect conflict is when renewable resource scarcity interacts with one or more social and economic factors uh, that especially if it is within a state or between states. And when the indirect conflict occurs, then the environmental factor is only one of so many hot potatoes that really uh, steps in to push off the economical tensions, the poverty tensions, the ethnic tensions within countries. So as you will see, when talking about environmental conflicts, it's not only a matter of local conflicts, it's a matter of world peace, world existence and world security. So uh, this is an eye opener. It is a very huge panorama on how to understand the environment, because maybe we all know and we all have, have heard that environment is a cross cutting issue. Environment is an intersectorial element. Yes, it is because it contributes to global security. It is because it contributes to every conflict and makes it raise and pop up in the worst case if environmental and resource scarcities are there. So if I would put in a diagram all what I shared, it is that it is a complex situation and it integrates into the living systems like that. When we talk about conflicts, we like it or we don't, there is always a demographic factor by human migration, population development, etc. that contributes to the, fact, to the conflict. And then there are the environmental factors that are scarcities in resources, but because of demographic factors. And then the environmental factors contribute and they push forward all the social and economic outcome factors. And if they are positive and negative, that would raise conflict. In order to show better this logic, when we think about environmental conflict, I have taken an example, which is not from our region, but is a case in Ethiopia when they say that there is a population growth happening in Ethiopia and at the same time uh, the population growth and overexploitation of uh, soil has contributed to an environmental factor which is soil degradation. Soil degradation uh, as an outcome uh, brings out land scarcity which means that agriculture output is going to decline so there is no uh, products. Also, considering that we are in Utopia, there are drought conditions more easily. So there is another environmental factor that contributes to the decline of agriculture products. So this will raise a conflict between pastoralists and agri agriculturalists. So is a conflict between very well identified two parties for existence. But at the same time, in a broader scale, it is a conflict of whole people living in Ethiopia because of the food products that they don't get. So this is it about uh, conflicts, type of conflicts where are they placed into the big picture and panorama and background of a situation and why we should consider them carefully and why nowadays a lot of ecological policies, a lot of uh, conflict resolution policies are bringing their attention into conflict resolution and environmental conflict resolution. So let's see how we can solve the environmental conflicts. When we talk about tools and methods to solve environmental conflicts, 
They do not differ much from all the other methods and tools that we use to solve other social and economic conflicts. What is important to know, if we really would like to solve an environmental conflict, independently if we use the right tool or not, what is important is that we need to properly understand the conflict. Where is the environmental factor involved? How much does it play into the conflict? And what we can deal to really stabilize and keep the environmental resource at the balance. This is the struggle for environmental conflicts, for environmental justice, for environmental rights. So it's not only about tools and methods. For example, uh, in the second lecture of the of this course, uh, you uh, got knowledge about ours convention, ac access to public information, public participation, and access to environmental justice. That is the basic of democracy, and that brought up the first time when you talk about environment and community rights over environment. It is a very advanced concept, but why is it different? Because if you need to have access to justice, environmental matters, you don't need only a judge and a lawyer, but what you need is a judge that understands environment, a lawyer that knows how to interpret the environmental systems and environmental vocabulary and consequences and implications. So it is much deeper than that. So when we talk about uh, environmental conflict resolutions, we talk about alternative dispute resolution, which is uh, how does negotiation and consensus building contribute in environmental dispute resolution. These methods and these tools can be from informal discussions to the use of force. So when we talk about dispute resolution, we don't talk about positive and successful dispute resolution. We consider it with all its elements. So what it, does it mean in formal discussion and to the use of force? So we start from letting the matter rest. So that we know there is a conflict, we do nothing about it, and we wait for it to be solved by itself or to be integrated in another conflict so that it will accelerate and it will be much more. Then we have, we take action by negotiating or taking legitimate use of the power and institutions. And then also there is actions like protest, violent exchanges, even war raised by environmental conflicts. So what are uh, the steps? What are the methods? What are the tools that we use? The first we do in action. So the decision is left to the chance and the conflict stays there. Then what we try to do is we try to reconciliate the parties that have different interests over the environmental resources. So we try to negotiate and to do negotiation we can use three ways. We can use facilitation, mediation, and non-binding arbitration. What is the difference and what they have in common? If we do reconciliation of interest, which means of parties with different interests, that means that the third party is needed there. Why? If we need the third party to facilitate, then this party needs to suggest the procedures for negotiation. So to tell the parties, what they need to do to negotiate. If we will do the mediation, then we need the third party to tell to the parties that are in conflict how they can broke into the negotiation. And for non-binding arbitration, what we need to do or the third party directly suggests a solution for the two other actors that are in conflict, but this solution, because it, is, it comes from non-binding arbitration, is not obligatory to the parties. They may choose to follow with it or not. And then, usually when reconciliation does not go well or when it doesn't start it at all, another right, another form is directly going to the 
uh, institution, authorities that through the court, through the litigation mentors, or the binding arbitration. So there is a third party that has the law authority to make a decision for the parties. And uh, after that, or at every step of the consensus and negotiation, what we can have is that decision made is made by the most powerful. And this is called coercion. So this is the most powerful who make the decision. It's it's sad, but it's realistic and it happens a lot. And in order to find the right solution, in order to make a proper analysis for improvements, we need to consider all alternatives. So why? If we do it, so if we use the consensus building and the negotiation properly without any uh, power uh, of the most uh, powerful person, then what we have? We have that we know what are the interests of the parties, so we understand them. And if we understand, means that we can find common ways together. What does it mean? At the same time, it builds working relationships. At the same time, it brings a lot of other alternatives to, uh, to be considered so that the parties develop in different ways but still keeping their interests. It is legitimate and also it improves communication and leads to wise commitments so people wisely think about solutions and their well-being. So, when do we have consensus building? Consensus building, it's about compromise. When we come together, the parties meet, their interests are met, and they think what each of them can compromise and up to what limits. So, so far, we are talking about these methods, and we think that when we uh, go to consensus, it is a much more uh, applaudable way because it's the parties cooperate with each other and the minority has a say. Have you heard about veto power? So the minority can say no and block the decision until the consensus for all parties is reached. Then the decision making group is inclusive, so all interested parties are present there, but not only to listen, but also to get involved. And they can be as active as they want in terms of uh, representing their interests. And so, when we build consensus and we really think about building consensus in an environmental conflict, then we think about the process being fully participatory. Why? Because it will be sustainable all the, all the time and it will be agreed. So all these ways are about solving conflict resolution, but a biggest, the biggest way to, to avoid environmental conflicts and conflict resolution is what you have gone through so far is the ARUS Convention, the right to proper information, to public consultation and participation. And the right to justice is when the conflict is raised and the consensus is not being made. So public participation in decision making, like public hearing, public consultations, are really um, kind of round table to negotiate and discuss with the wider public. But also you should consider that uh, it's not only a matter of public and the decision makers when we talk about environmental conflicts, but it's also a matter of different stakeholders like uh, industries, industries and the states, industries and the communities, different businesses within each other, local businesses, etc, etc. So because of that, the issue is very complex. And so, what do we gain if we use alternative dispute resolution apart from what the law and decision maker will show us? We will increase the understanding of the issues. Uh, the parties will meet face to face and will explore the problem and alternative solutions. And they will trust each other 
at least they will boost trust into each other and because they will take active leadership in the discussion and the, in the communication, it will lead to commitment to the outcomes. So they, so they will, will really care what this prob what this issue will will bring and this commitment. And it also it will save them time and money for the longer term. But on the other side, because alternative dispute resolution in environmental conflicts are based on the voluntarily of uh, of parties, they uh, they cannot be like uh, cannot be uh, sustainable over the time, which means that some of them may trigger, may may think differently, may withdraw from the commitment, etc., etc. And also, when we talk about inclusiveness and participation, interests of parties are not easily represented well. And there also can be manipulations because they are informal processes. Even though I personally, I might say that even informal processes, there are a lot of manipulations so that the less powerful people are not represented. So always they need to safeguard themselves for this type of things. And uh, sometimes beliefs of people are not negotiate negotiable. So that means that they will not drop off their interests so easily. But at the same time, uh, it is a quite a uh, step uh, in order to solve a dispute and to find common solution. Sometimes positive thinking and positive attitude, positive behavior is the success of a conflict resolution and not uh, necessarily the, the, the outcome of this dispute. And now we are talking here about public in environmental conflict about different uh, economic, industrial, political, ecological interest when we talk about environmental conflicts and we talk about parties that negotiate, so we talk all about humans and who talks about environmental resources. So there is a voice that defends environmental re resources above all and this Nowadays, these people are called environmental defenders, that they are key actors that during the environmental conflict defend the environment against the negative social and ecological impacts. Why they do it? Because sometimes they are indigenous communities, local communities, and their life uh, directly depends on those resources. But at, at the same time, they can be uh, actors that their work and their mission and their lively commitments are linked to environmental resources. So usually the environmental defenders are self-organized uh, local groups or they are globally organized into international networks. And they can be, like I said, indigenous people, peasants, fishermen, environmental activists, social movements, journalists, etc., etc. And by the UN Right Councils in 2019, there is a recognition that there can be no environmental protection without the respect and the recognition of the work of for environmental defenders. So how do we understand this? We understand this, that the issue and the work they do is so serious and to protect environmental services, to protect environmental resources, go against so many interests that assassinations of environmental defenders is one of the highest and most visible expression of direct violence that appears in environmental conflicts. And by the Environmental Justice Atlas, there are three aspects of violence against environmental defenders assassinations, physical violence, and the criminalization of environmental defenders. So this is the way how the power use itself in order to stop an environmental conflict. So how do environmental defenders work and how do they use the different forms and they are non-violent interventions? But what they do is that they completely 
intervene for uh, for lawsuits and I'm sorry. So environmental defenders use different forms of nonviolent interventions like lawsuits, objections to environmental impact assessments, reports that provide the perspective of effective communities on conflicts projects. So this is what they use usually. But when these forms do not uh, do not come out uh, uh, posit in positive results, then they do what they are very well known for, roadblocks, occupation of public buildings, land occupation, self-sacrifice as well. And if we think about uh, these ways, and if we think about the conflict resolution environmental matters, I can point out that objections to environmental impact assessments and reports that provide the perspective of affected communities are uh, the measures that uh, open the way to communication, to negotiation, to mediation with decision makers, with um, uh, the economic development sector, with industry. So when they do that, they provide really arguments to point out the conflicts and the interest for protect, protection of the environment. So. But when they are not listened, when they are neglected, then they have to go to the uh, to the most uh, massive and uh, pressure strategies like the roadblocks, also to lawsuits. And recently, by using the environmental legislation, lawsuits are becoming a powerful source for environmental defenders to protect the environmental interests. So what do they want, these environmental defenders? All they want is that the cancellation of conflictive projects. So these uh, conflictive projects that would, would uh, impact uh, into uh, lowering environmental resources and increase uh, the social conflicts and the non-equal distribution of benefits and costs of environmental uh, resources. So this is a common goal they all have and they mobilize when they have an environmental conflict in order to, can to cancel this conflict project. It can be a hydropower, it can be a dam, it can be a new law that will affect everyone, etc, etc, etc. And usually, not in all of the cases, but there are cases where when they succeed to cancel a conflict project and it will require decades to do so. Decades, not only a lawsuit, but sometimes they manage. And it is recognized that it is uh, good to understand it, to know uh, what strategy do they use when they succeed. So, what is uh, what is a nonviolent bottom-up mobilization is that they really would like to protect environment and they uh, fight for sustainable development and they what what they would like to know is that uh, they are there as various forms of grassroots environmentalism they are globally and it indicates a promising force for environmental sustainability and social justice uh, even though it comes with a heavy price, which is violence, repression, even assassin assassination, the environmental defenders are there to talk about environmental interests. So this is a picture to show you that in, 19, in 1970 was the first protest for the Earth Day and publicly raised the need for a controlled and sustainable use of environmental resources in America. And so there is always protests nowadays, uh, protests that sometimes environmental defenders and community want to do, 
because this is the way they see through it. Sometimes they are obliged to do, but what they always want is a peaceful protest and to be heard. So, uh, if you would like to know, I didn't bring, uh, because for me it is important to share the evolution of the term and uh, the situation of an environmental conflict nowadays and how it can be seen interlinked with every element of, the, of our lives and existence. I didn't bring a concrete example, because I think that if you go to the atlas, uh, and you will see uh, all it interaction. And for example, if you search here, your country, for example, Montenegro. And you will see all the environmental conflict raised in Montenegro and described. You see, we have uh, the query, we have the unsanitary landfill in this. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not reading the name of the place because it's very difficult for me. But then we have wastewater treatment collector in Botton in Montenegro. And if you click see more, then you will have information on the case, what it is about, where it is located and what are the conflicts and how is the project details and what is happening and how it ended, et cetera, et cetera, and who was involved, et cetera, et cetera. So this is it. And here you have for all our region, a case study of environmental conflict, how it went, where it happens, why it happens, and you will see how diverse the interests, socioeconomic interests, and environmental uh, com and environmental implications are, and how they are or are not solved nowadays. So this is it. And then I, what I wanted to go briefly into a couple of slides before, before I end up my, uh, my presentation is that in order to address, especially as an environmental defender, in order to address the environmental conflict, uh, we all should be very well, very well aware that it is not about a moment. It is not that all these people just woke up and they thought to, to fight the environmental crisis, the climate crisis. Yes, maybe it started like that with two or three people, but when it becomes a movement and when it becomes at the point that it needs a resolution, it needs a solution because the conflict is too much, that will mean that it's a long, long way of work, of building strategies. And what it is called all this way of thinking and how these uh, environmental defenders, when they are organized globally, uh, not only in the grassroots levels, how they work is about advocacy actions. So what does it mean? It means that they speak. There is a person or a group that speaks to support an issue and so that this issue is being heard. And why is the advocacy needed, it is needed to change policies that have an impact on people's lives and also to change practices. So what is important to know when we go for an environmental conflict through advocacy is that what we need to do is to understand what is the change that we want to bring to the society with that and what is the problem that we would like to solve. And is it in our mission and in, in whose mission it is so that we join and we have advocacy and we have policy advocacy and public advocacy. A lot of these actions are very well thought and need a lot of time. And so in order to be successful in advocacy, there are different steps to be taken and you will see that the first nine steps are only the preparatory phase. What does it mean? It means that as complex an environmental conflict is, 
the most complex is the SWOT analysis, the understanding of the situation, the building up of strategies, the building up of solutions, and then to implement all the thinking and to monitor and evaluate what we do about that. So we select the topic of the problem, we analyze it, the objectives. What is very much important is stakeholders analysis. Stakeholders means all the actors that have a stake or a saying or an interest into the situation. So then uh, there is the action. OK, so we do the problem analysis like environmental defenders. I talk here and also this is something even uh, even if we are not on the environmental defender side, but we are on the industrial side on of in the infrastructure project side, we would like to know this. Why? Because we when we build our development projects, we build with concrete and less impact solutions. I think by working in this sector for so many years, I think that even for the development sectors like the banks that offer money for the infrastructure, development sectors, the companies that lend their money and invest their resources there, it's not a good thing to have an environmental conflict. They would like to avoid it. And how they can avoid it is really by having this problem tree analysis, because they would like to know, to really know what the problem can they cause and what solution they can influence. Usually, as environmental defenders, we use the, with the problem tree analysis, when we see what are the causes, what is the problem and what are the consequences. And so building on that, we define uh, objectives, effects and causes in order to understand and to see what we are moving for. And also, if you know the stakeholder analysis, it's very important, even in your cases that you have worked so far, you for sure have identified the stakeholders and where do they stand in terms of the conflict, environmental conflict that they have been raised. So are we talking about stakeholders that have interest in our case and that have power in our case? And where do they stay? Do they have low interest and how po high power? Or do they have low interest, low power, high interest, are high power, etc. So this is very important when we would like to address our case. And so we do the stakeholder analysis and then we develop the strategy of advocacy. And as I said, it goes like the same as the environmental conflict resolution. The advocacy campaign is part of the environmental conflict resolution. It goes usually with persuasion and conviction strategy and until pressure strategy. So initially we negotiate, we build argument, we think twice, we try to be to influence the decision makers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then at the end, when this doesn't work or that is not being considered equally, it goes with pressure strategy. That means opposing that are the street protests, blockades, court cases, etc. And environmental defenders and all the actors involved in an environmental conflict do not like the opposing strategy. They all hope to solve issues in negotiation strategy, but it doesn't always happen like that. So this is how we work. And now I am getting out of this screen share at the moment. Uh, now I will go through. OK, I will go through the comments if they are. Yes, Natasha, this is very uh, true. If there is a strategic approach to negotiations, there would be less misunderstanding and scaling up to conflicts. Uh, which dog? I don't understand. Hope the dog didn't eat nobody. OK. Uh, and then Angelia didn't see my screen, just the presentation. OK. 
uh, I had a technical issue with my screen and my presentation, but important was that you saw the presentation. So if there aren't any more questions to this, I will explain uh, your assignment. Uh, so you will continue to work on the case that you identified in week one from the perspective on, of environmental conflict. But also I added up that if you'd like to work on a case that you would choose from the environmental justice atlas, it would be still OK. So what you would need to do in your assignment is uh, to look at the different stakeholders interests. And uh, decision making process and the affected environmental, social and economic values in the situation that you have. So you should state what is the environmental conflict that is happening. You should analyze the causes of the conflict and the different interests that are affected of the stakeholders. And uh, this would be like needed two arguments of public participation in decision making to be used to open negotiations first as a first step for conflict resolution. And uh, you should propose a conflict resolution approach with action plan and timetable. So what would you like to do? And elaborate the expected result of the resolution approach on the, conf on the environmental conflict. So if you choose this approach, this method, this tool, for conflict resolution, what would be the expected result from your side? And uh, the entire assignment should be uh, delivered as an analytical paper document with a maximum of 2000 words. And it should be concise and uh, not too much uh, time consuming in terms of writing it. And as you have been so far uh, engaging into the forum for all your questions, this would be the case also for, for this assignment. So any questions about it? Mm, yes, I would be eager to see the different tools that are presented here. Thank you, Natasha. Mm. Yes, I have. Uh, a successful negotiation process, I have. Uh, it was an example between Albania and Kosovo for the electricity interconnection line. It was a development project that was eager to start between the two states and the two governments. It was a project that was uh, supposed to be financed by uh, KHFW, um, a development bank, a German bank. And uh, the company prepared uh, the technical project and the environmental impact assessment. And in parallel to that, the communities of interest, because the project was uh, similar to go through the most pristine areas and to affect the local communities' economies where the interconnection light was going to be built, especially not directly with the electricity per se, but especially during construction phase. And the environment, there was environmental defenders at the step that they prepared uh, a parallel environmental impact assessment. So they built argument and they went to the first public consultation meeting, presented their arguments and their concern about the technical project, how it developed and how it did not consider environmental conflicts and community interest and local developments. So the representatives of the bank were there and uh, after that, uh, the bank decided to withdraw from the project until it was um, uh, properly done. So that was 
a successful negotiation process. So the environmental defenders were the one who started the negotiation on behalf of the local communities that would have been affected by the project. Another uh, successful negotiation uh, process. Um, it was a case also in Albania. I am bringing cases from Albania because this is the, the cases that I know the most. Uh, is a case uh, they wanted a thermal power plant uh, uh, in Porto Romano, which is an area close to, to the Adriatic coast in Duras in Albania. And um, yeah, the contracting uh, company that wanted to build the thermal power plant started uh, uh, to prepare the public information and participation process as the law was requiring. And then uh, they didn't do it at all. Uh, they were obliged by they just started and communicated that they were going to do it, but they didn't do it. So in this case, uh, the local community and some of environmental NGOs in Albania addressed to the Ministry of Environment that uh, the company has is not going through the right procedures and that this is a big and a huge uh, technical uh, project that will impact a lot of uh, ecosystems, marine ecosystem, um, terrestrial ecosystems and the life of the inhabitants there. So it must go through the proper uh, consultations. So the ministry stopped uh, the ongoing procedures to develop the technical project and they halted the company to prepare the environmental impact assessment and all the, all the environmental conflict resolutions, proposals, solutions, mitigations. Uh, so this happened and at the end the company withdrew from the project at all. Uh, another Uh, um, I think that this is a very huge, uh, this is a very interesting uh, question. So according to my experience, what could be the regional ratio of successful versus unsuccessful negotiations? Um, so in terms of outcomes, so if we consider what the outcome would be, if the the scope of negotiation was to cancel the bad projects, let's say, it, that would have environmental impact. If we think of that, uh, of that perspective, I think that the, ra the ratio is very, very uh, low. Um, it can be one in 50, maybe, or, or even much, but if we can, if we measure success about raising the voice, raising concerns and mitigation of environmental impacts, I think this is very high. So uh, how to, to, to make it uh, concrete, like, yeah, yeah, thank you, Viliana. So this is it. So it depends what do we call success. In environment, it is very hard to reach the outcome that would be that this project should not be done. For example, now in Albania, we have a very huge environmental conflict, which is building the uh, building the an international a national international airport in uh, a protected area, a protected landscape in the coast in Narta Lagoon, and it is a top-down decision-making process. So uh, in this case, because the government decided so by neglect, neglecting and not being open to any form of negotiation, immediately we don't do negotiation; we go to the court because you, you don't have any other options. But for example, there is a successful case of advocacy for Viosa National Parks. Maybe you have heard about it, that a lot of years were supposed to advocate and to bring up protests, concerts, uh, dialogue tables in order to build arguments why it deserves to be a protected area. This is a good 
outcome. And so we have a local issue, an environmental conflict at local level in Tirana, in our uh, uh, Tirana Grand Lake Park, they wanted to build um, a playground for children, but initially the project was not made public and the project that leaked was like uh, it had a lot of buildings and concrete and nothing similar to an ecological playground for kids. So because of protest and because of uh, discussion tables and negotiation tables, um, even though a lot of violence has been uh, 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 has been on the on the citizens, then the new project that was developed was completely an ecological project. So in terms of a cancellation of project, in terms of building a better society, maybe that outcome didn't show up. Uh, but in terms of reflection of the local decision makers, in terms of showing that the community is aware of environment, that even that if decision making if decision makers will forget about it, we will not. This is this was a great outcome, so a great success, I would say. So this is a lot of uh, things to consider at different and complex levels. Okay. Thank you, Tamara. Is there any other curiosity uh, question that you would like to share? I really understand the complexity of the topic. Uh, so I would understand all your questions and your, um, your doubts in whatever information is shared today. Even though I am not a fan of online lectures and of not interacting with uh, participants, this was still a nice experience to be able at least to share and then through the week to be able to discuss together. So thank you for your participation and all your future questions. <laughs>